All right. Well, welcome everyone to our partner webinar series. Thank you all so much for being here today. We have a wonderful presentation prepared today with members of the Law Firm Information Governance Symposium in Iron Mountain. My name is Kayla and I'm the project coordinator for our training and certifications here at ARMA. I'm here with a few announcements today before we get started. If you're not a current ARMA member, we highly encourage you to visit ARMA.org to learn all about the benefits of becoming a professional member. We offer online education as well as chapter and industry opportunities con to connect and gain professional resources through your membership. Visit ARMA.org for additional information. Our holiday sale has started. This holiday season, give the gift of knowledge. All items in the ARMA online store will be 25% off. Please use code ARMAHOLIDAYS25 to take advantage of this discount. And don't forget, mark your calendars for InfoCon 2022 in Nashville, October 16th through 19th. I know we're all eager to see each other in person. And with that said, the call for proposals for ARMA InfoCon 2022 is now open. Be a part of the action at ARMA International's InfoCon. Start your applications today at armainfocon.org. Before we get to today's presentation, I'd like to give a few housekeeping items. If you have questions for our experts today, please make sure you put it in our Q&A box. We will be sending out a link to the presentation and slides, as well as the IGP pre-approval code for our IGPs attending this webinar. Please keep an eye on your email within the next couple of days for our follow-up. We'd like to take a second to thank the wonderful people at Iron Mountain and the members of the Law Firm Information Governance Symposium. It's because of their support, we are able to bring you additional programs and services. When considering products and services for your business, we hope you consider partners like Iron Mountain who support you. I'd like to introduce you to our moderator today, Jim Merrifield. Jim is a certified IGP and the director of IG and business intake at Robinson and Cole LLP. Thank you, Jim. Thanks so much, Kayla and Arma and Iron Mountain for this opportunity and welcome to all of you uh, to the Law Firm Information Governance Symposium webinar uh, series with Arma featuring reports published during 2021. And the papers we'll feature today are client information governance requests, how the landscape has changed, supply chain risk, risk management and law firms, getting started in a practical guidance and strategies for collaboration, site governance and law firms. So now I'd like to introduce our panelists. So I'm excited to be joined by such an impressive group of industry leaders. And again, I'm your moderator, uh, Jim Merrifield with Robinson and Cole. Our uh, panelists are Chuck Barth with Shepard Mullen. And Chuck has over 16 years of experience on data and information governance with, within the legal world. Chuck has a proven record of restructuring business processes to ensure streamlined and efficient processes that meet all compliance requirements. He has a strong history of evolving firms from locally managed programs to firm-wide matter centricity and clearly defined standardized processes of data governance. With us too is Patty Fitzpatrick with Seiforth Shaw. Patty is a multidisciplinary professional and change manager with a demonstrated track record, record of driving innovation. She's a recognized leader with a career focused on advancing governance, risk and compliance related to initiatives within the legal industry for over 30 years. Also, we have Galena Daskowski with the Board of Directors at Open Access. Galena is a serial entrepreneur with many years of experience in cybersecurity and information governance. She holds a PhD in computer science and is proud to be a member of the Company of Fellows of ARMA International. She's also an avid scuba diver and loves to work with lawyers and swim with sharks. So I definitely have to introduce Galena to some of my law firm uh, partners. And Karen Allen with Wiley Rain. Karen has a, spent her career immersed in the technology side of the business side of law. She brings a technology and data focused approach to information governance. 
So you might be wondering if you're if you're new to Elfix and this webinar, what is Elfix? Well, Iron Mountain established the law firm Information Governance Symposium in 2012 as a platform to the legal industry to create an information governance roadmap unique to law firms. And there's a steering committee of five law firms that guides the mission and direction of the symposium. And the symposium offers definition, definitions, uh, processes, and best practices for building law firm IG. The reports are authored by law firm leaders and subject matter experts from the service provider community. And in 2021, amid a, a pandemic for the last couple of years, our group published three papers with, with a focus on the lasting impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And today we're going to discuss uh, three of them uh, today. So at this time, I'd like to pass the baton to Sue Trombley with Iron Mountain, our sponsor of this webinar. Sue, please. Thank you, Jim. If you could just forward to the next slide, that's great. So I can't tell you how proud Iron Mountain is to have sponsored the Law Firm Information Governance Symposium for 10 years now. It's an active and engaged and productive group of 40 plus subject matter experts who really have a sincere interest in embedding information governance best practices into all law firms as the reports show year after year. So we do encourage you to go and look at those reports that, that are all um, on a site that Jim will share the, the URL for. So just real quick, a couple of words about Iron Mountain, we're your sponsor today. We've been around for 70 years and evolving with you as you've moved from physical into digital. And as the members of Elfigs have certainly been talking about over the last year or so, they're seeing an accelerated digital transformation and Iron Mountain is there with you to, to help you along the way. Um, and more and more organizations more recently have started to say that they're ready to start cleaning up legacy files and records and data and documents. It's a number one priority for 2022 and whether that's for destruction or imaging or better identification, I just want to, to let you know that Iron Mountain can be there to help you achieve those goals too. So Jim, if you could just advance one more slide, what I would love for all of you to do is continue to rethink Iron Mountain. We are more than box. Um, we are around the world. We're up to 63 countries now. We can help you with your physical and your digital storage. Um, so when it's time for you to take more action around information governance, please don't hesitate to reach out to Iron Mountain and have a wonderful uh, webinar, Jim and company. I know you've worked really hard on these reports and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the discussion today. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sue, and, and Iron Mountain, of course, for, you know, on behalf of Elfigs, where we, again, could not uh, thank you enough for your support and uh, helping us further and educate the, the industry. Thank you so much uh, for, for your uh, participation and support uh, through the years. Well, at this time, I'd like to uh, hand the baton over to Chuck Barth, uh, who will focus on our first segment, Client IG Requests how the landscape has changed. And again, as was, was mentioned before I hand it over to Chuck, after each segment, we'll pause for a brief Q&A. So feel, feel free to send your questions in the chat and we'll have those answered after, after the segment. So Chuck, take it away. Great, well, thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm gonna talk about our paper that we wrote on the client engage or uh, outside council guidelines and what we're now calling client information governance requests or cigars. So the, the key to start on all this is just to understand the difference between engagement letters and these client requirements. It has changed over the years and evolved. Uh, for many years, uh, the engagement letter was the standard communication between a law firm and their outside counsel. And this was usually one way from the law firm to the client that set the expectations on what the representation is, how things are billed, uh, anything special about uh, retention, what, what they will charge for. 
And probably around 2010, uh, clients be began creating their own version and they became known as outside counsel guidelines, or as I mentioned recently, uh, client information governance requirements. And what this was, was clients kind of dictating to uh, law firms how business should be conducted with them. Uh, it can cover all sorts of different things, not just uh, like how the law firm will, will uh, represent, but a lot of these things will uh, revolve around data privacy, uh, billing requirements, how their invoice should look, um, all kinds of things. And these are things that maybe the attorney may not be well versed in. So it really needs the whole village and the administrative team to be aware of what these requirements are coming up so that they can be reviewed. And um, Make, make sure that your law firm can accommodate them. A lot of these things may supersede what is in your engagement letter, so you need to be careful of that. And it may be counter to some of your policies, so careful review with your general counsel and con conversations with the client uh, will need to happen to make sure that you both are in agreement. And also to make sure that any of your following initiatives might be that might impact them, which we'll cover on the next slide. So outside council guidelines will have an impact on your firm priorities and initiatives, and they should. Uh, every, everything that you do uh, and, and things that you accept, uh, any further projects or updates or changes to your workflow must be able to accommodate. Uh, all of these customizations. So you, your billing system must be flexible to be able to build invoices, uh, to account for things that the client is asking for. Uh, your document management system should be able to be uh, secure information. A record system with retention, your retention tool should be flexible. Uh, along with especially inf information security uh, regarding how information is stored, maybe what encryption is used, data breaches. So all of these things cover them. And it does take some ad administrative costs too to keep up with them. And you, the, all firms must take a holistic approach. So everybody needs to be involved. We kind of need to take a look at the whole thing, whole thing and identify what these common requests are. Uh, you know, following the kind of 80-20 rule, if you can find out what a lot, a lot of the common requirements are, you can kind of build on that and make use those requirements uh, to uh, prioritize future projects and initiatives. Such as workflow and tools. Uh, and here's some decision points that you uh, will need to account for as you go through your projects. Uh, you want to consider the scope. What should be included? What systems uh, are, should be included? What departments should be included? How far do we want to go uh, in building this tool or workflow? What should it account for? And are, is it going to account for all commitments to client or the majority? So, you need to be able to sit down with your stakeholders and discuss and decide that before you even start, just so you can define a scope and stick with that through your project. It's very important during that requirements gathering phase to determine what systems are impacted. You don't want to be surprised down the road that uh, a, a particular system is going to not be able to meet your requirements uh, that the client has given. So you need to identify those and can the, the system uh, maintain those uh, requirements? And it's great at this point to know the limitations uh, of these systems. Can it, like what, what are the limitations? How far can it go? Because uh, th that'll be very important with AI ba based technology. You're gonna have to train those systems uh, to be able to do what you want it to do and refine its accuracy. Uh, it doesn't come out of the box knowing everything. So you have to feed it information, let it grow and learn. 
And all these technologies and workflow can enhance your efficiencies, but it's only good as the processes that you build. If your current processes are broken, don't work well, automating it is not going to solve that problem. You need to work that out uh, ahead of time, develop your efficient processes, and make sure that um, it's going to hit everything you need it to. And by that, you can expo explore a lot of the proven practices that we'll go through on the next slide. So here's a, a list of some of the proven practices. On the full paper, uh, we have a whole segment on them and I encourage everybody to read the paper uh, as with all the papers that we're discussing today. Uh, but some of the very important proven practices or best practices that we can recommend is defining and documenting your standard operating procedures, SOPs. Make sure that you've got everything defined and who's doing what in what order. Uh, and then you can go to automating those. Uh, centralizing the management of the process. If, you're, if your process is kind of scattered about, uh, this area is doing one thing you know, people are sending the documents to this person, but not that person. It can kind of go awry and the right people are, may not be looking at those documents or accounting for it. And they get signed with the uh, client before everybody has a chance to review. But if you centralize the management of the process, it will all funnel through to one unit and they will make sure that each areas looking at what it needs to, uh, making sure the review happens and any, anything is uh, worked out with the client. It's great to also create a reference bank for approved responses, especially around your limitations uh, that we defined earlier as part of the, the scope and the systems. If you have this bank of uh, firm responses will allow you to easily respond to a client if they're asking for a certain type of uh, encryption or storage. Uh, if you're not able to accommodate, you can easily just use that phrase instead of having to recreate the wheel with every single uh, outside counsel guideline that you receive. Another best practice is to store them in a central repository. If they're kind of scattered about, different naming conventions and different areas, it's gonna be a real problem trying to locate this information when you need to look at it quickly. So it's good to have a central repository with a standard naming convention that might contain the client name or the client number. That way you can just go into the repository, search for those terms and boom, there's your document. You wanna make sure that each administrative area is included, you know, anywhere from security to billing to marketing. And they are empowered to review and make decisions or recommendations. Ultimately, the, the final signing and decision might be uh, up to your general counsel, but these people need to be accountable and be able to uh, be empowered to speak up. Some really uh, good points to keep an eye out for on these guidelines are privacy considerations. Privacy considerations is the, the big thing nowadays. HIPAA, GDPR, CCPA, uh, we need to be able to uh, pull that out from the guidelines and make sure we can accommodate. Review any indemnification clauses and even breach notification response times. Uh, some, for, some clients may have a, a really short re response time and you need to be able to make sure you can accommodate that with your systems tool and staffing. So all those need to be worked out. So this was just a, a, a good overview of the paper. And again, I encourage you to read the whole thing. Uh, Jim, are there any questions? Yes, thank you, Chuck, for that, uh, for that overview. And uh, now it's your time to uh, be on the hot seat. So there are a few questions uh, that came in. The first one we'd like to ask you, Chuck, is uh, do you have a suggested format for keeping approved firm responses? Uh, it can vary. Uh, Excel is always good. You know, if you have another like SharePoint database, you know, there's a lot of different uh, tools within SharePoint and Teams now too, that you can account for that in different grids, but even something as basically as Excel uh, can work too. 
Uh, definitely makes sense, right? Sometimes we got to revert to the old faithful Excel, right? And just to add on to Chuck's response, there definitely are, you know, software applications out there. There's there's a few, right, that uh, can help with, um, you know, keeping those logged responses for sure. So we got another question for you, Chuck. Um, how do you make sure that one client's requirements is not in conflict with another? So that's an interesting question. What do you think? Well, I'm not sure, you know, I, it would be great to hear a specific use case about that. I mean, every client might have their own uh, requirements, but it, it might not conflict with someone else's. You know, a lot of clients' requirements are only a small group of people can look at my stuff or uh, invoices. It's not going to preclude uh, another client's wishes. Right. No, that's a fair point. Well, what, what about, uh, speaking off the cuff here, what about like cloud requirements, right? Like some clients, um, even now in 2021, have strict like requirements where their data is stored, right? And for law firms, that's a can be a real struggle, right? Because, you know, not having data in the cloud is kind of a, a thing of the past. So, I mean, I guess, how would you handle that? You know, what's your advice? Um, you know, that? Well, that, that falls in the know your limitations and you have to be able to have a, a conversation with the client saying, this is how we operate. You know, you, you can't really operate uh, information in different ways. Uh, you know, if you're using something like net documents where your information is in the cloud, your information is in the cloud and there, you, know, you have to be able to demonstrate what protections there are. There might be a specific matter, like if you have a government contract type matter that requires, you know, national security uh, type uh, protection around it, that can be handled as an exception if you needed it on like an off network type storage and encryption. Oh, very good. Yeah, I mean, it seems like, you know, a lot of these, these guidelines, the OCGs coming from clients, it seems like the uh, the thing to do is to to have a sit down, right, with our clients and review maybe the OCGs to make sure that we're all on the same page. Do you have any advice on on how to do that? Well, generally, it's the relationship partner that starts that conversation. Uh, every firm might be set up differently. Uh, you might have people in your general counsel's office that are responsible for uh, maintaining the communication mm -hmm. with the client or uh, trying to accommodate something if there's questions, but generally that relationship partner is key to that uh, discussion. Sure, no, that, that makes sense. And I think uh, people are just looking at the chat, uh, people agree with you. So that's a, that was a right, on, right on the money there, Chuck. So just a last question. Um, it seems like there's a lot of requirements to kind of keep together. I mean, would it be wise for a firm to, are you, or are you seeing firms, I guess I could say, dedicating like a person or a team to manage the, managing these outside counsel guidelines? Or is it just like, you know, something, something that is just added to someone's uh, role? Well, it really depends on the firm's maturity and information governance and, and processes too. Uh, a lot of firms are dedicating resources to this because the number of uh, these client information governance requests keep growing. And like you mentioned, it's hard to keep track and make sure that everything's being reviewed. So depending on how your firm is structured, there could be a variety of uh, places within a firm that might be responsible. A lot of it revolves around the risk management. Uh, so uh, information governance, conflicts, business intake, general counsel, a lot of those places uh, might have a team or specific resources that coordinate the efforts. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, well, thank you so much. That's all the time we have for Chuck being on the hot seat. He'll be here uh, the duration of the webinar. So if there's questions that come in, if we can't uh, get to them, we'll certainly reach reach out to you directly. But thank, thank you so much, Chuck, for Certainly. covering the paper. So moving along to our next topic, I'd like to hand, uh, hand the baton, pass the baton off to uh, Patty and Galena as they'll discuss supply chain risk management in law firms.
So Patty and Galena, take it away. Thank you, Jim. So if you don't mind advancing to the next slide for us. Wonderful. So uh, I think we've all could relate to the supply chain topic, especially because we hear about it quite a bit on the news and supply chain shortages and failures. So likewise, it's extremely important to um, talk about supply chain where it relates to law firms. And maybe sometimes it's not, not the most obvious thing to think about as it pertains to the legal community, but we are all involved in uh, the supply chain today. So. Uh, we might be buying services from a company as a law firm, for example, and the company may be hosting their product in a third party cloud. So you could kind of see the chain and maybe that uh, hosted uh, product is written on top of another software, which is another piece of the supply chain. Not to mention, of course, uh, where you are buying things, who's an authorized vendor in the traditional physical sense. So when we start talking about this supply chain and why the increasing uh, why the increasing uh, focus on that. So there's certainly the, as we heard from uh, Chuck, and we talked a little bit about cybersecurity incidents and, re and situations. Uh, certainly when you start thinking about cybersecurity and client requirements, you must think supply chain because maybe you are not going to have the breach, but your supplier might have a breach. Uh, in fact, I've worked with a law firm not, not too long ago where um, they were being targeted very heavily by a foreign government. And they really couldn't quite figure out exactly why, but since they service certain particular clients, this particular foreign government thought that a good way to get to their clients was through whatever might be the weak link in the supply chain um, of that client. So when you, when you talk about supply chains, two things. One, who do you use as your vendor for cybersecurity purposes, but also who are your clients? And if you're going to meet those clients, clients requirements as Chuck outlined, how much do you need to know about your supply chain? How are you protecting yourself? Become both really key questions. And to that end, Chuck, I was thinking about that question about conflicting um, accounts, uh, conflicting requirements. One client said, might say, I only, want to use vendor X and another client says, I never want you to use vendor X because I find them weak in my supply chain. So that could actually be something to think about because of this broader global view. Um, so I already touched on client expectations, but clients will expect for you to vet your suppliers really carefully to make sure that you are not in danger of being breached or buying something that is uh, going to be in a, by the way, one other point on supply chain too is as ESG becomes more, um, prevalent and people are thinking about that, right? Uh, as you think about your ESG, who is your supplier? How are they complying with ESG issues also becomes important. So client expectations to that end are also quite interesting. Um, now domestic and information in, and international dat data privacy laws, of course, and Chuck also touched on this. So a lot of these topics are very much interrelated. So if I am buying services from a vendor, is my data going to be segregated? Let's say if I operate for a client on the GDPR, are they going to guarantee that segregation for me? So when I'm evaluating my supply chain, um, any of those requirements that either I operate under or my clients operate under are really, really important. Likewise, if you have clients in regulated industries, uh, those regulations become important. Again, if you're, let's say, sending somebody's data to process to, uh, let's say, a uh, litigation support vendor, is that vendor going to be falling under, let's say, the HIPAA compliance requirements because you've now signed it with the client. So your obligations transfer over to the supply chain, right? As you share client's data potentially. Uh, and so that becomes really important to think about. And oftentimes insurers do require for your uh, cybersecurity cover coverage in particular to be valid for you to have a strong supply chain management process. So there are many reasons to think about the supply chain as you think about your law firm's well-being. Um, Patty, would you like to add to that? I would. Thank you, Galena. Um, one comment I would like to add uh, relating to the 
cloud storage question that came up during Chuck's uh, segment. Um, having a robust vendor management program is really going to help you address those difficult questions with your clients in relation to your vendors when they come up. And uh, to support that, you know, if you go through a proper vendor uh, onboarding and security assessment, you're going to collect what's known as uh, mitigating controls and documentation that you can attest to the client that you've vetted the vendor in a significant amount of detail and made an educated decision before moving that before moving the client's data to the cloud. So that's going to become increasingly important as more and more of our enterprise systems start migrating to the cloud at scale. Um, I also wanted to expand on a comment Glena made uh, regarding ESG. Um, I'm not sure if everybody in the audience today knows what ESG is. It, it's, not, it's actually environmental, social, and governance. And the environmental part, you want to make sure that you're engaging vendors who are socially responsible, who are thinking about climate change, pollution, waste, how they manage waste, do they recycle? Are they concerned about greenhouse gases? On the social side, we're talking about fair working conditions, diversity of the workforce, you know, being against things like human trafficking. Um, on the governance side, we're looking at corporate responsibility and making sure that the board of directors is not corrupt or taking kickbacks and bribes. So really focusing on making sure that your, your vendors that you're doing business with are uh, responsible suppliers and people that you want uh, representing a relationship back with your company. Next slide, please. Yes. Thank you, Patty. That was excellent. And by the way, Iron Mountain has a tremendous environmental program. Just thought I'd mention it. <laughs> So one of the keys to uh, having a robust vendor uh, program in place is assembling a multidisciplinary team from the get-go. Uh, you really want to make sure that uh, you engage people from all these various departments. And not every law firm is going to have every one of these departments. But if you don't have a department, you likely have somebody in a different department performing the duties and responsibilities of that uh, department that does not formally exist. So for example, things like procurement. Not every law firm has a procurement department. The procurement function is really kind of a growing trend in law firms. Uh, at my firm in particular, we are getting ready to build out a formal procurement department. That department is envisioned to um, be responsible for the initial vendor onboarding, doing a lot of due diligence, really vetting the vendor, making sure that the vendor is somebody uh, that we want to do business with, that they have sound financial background themselves, uh, looking at reputational risks, business risks, uh, clearing conflicts on the vendor, looking to see if that vendor is also a firm client, uh, are we adverse to them in a you know, heated litigation, things like that. The accounts payable finance department, that one's pretty straightforward. I think every law firm has some type of accounting or finance department. They're the ones that pay all the invoices coming in. They file the taxes. Um, and as I'll get into some more detail about accounting and finance and how they can help you on the next slide. Um, but the, nope, nope, sorry. <laughs> um, information governance, they're going to be your gatekeepers. They're the ones that are going to really um, manage the policy or the standard and make sure that um, the firm is adhering to what they laid out to do. So they'll be doing some monitoring and some compliance measuring. Data governance, uh, that department may not exist, but it's important to have good data integrity uh, so that you can pull the data from various systems 
and rely on it. So, you know, another uh, case study from our firm and what we've been through during our journey over the last year, year and a half. Right now, we're going through a big data cleanup. We're trying to collect contact information and pull that out of various systems and piece it all together so we have a good, clean uh, starting point to reach out to our vendors when we're ready to do so. Data privacy and security, these kind of go hand in hand. Uh, oftentimes, uh, these teams reside within your IT department. Sometimes they stand alone and report to uh, the general counsel or the chief operating officer as an independent function, but likely they're the ones that are sending out formal uh, privacy, security, SIG light assessments, doing some kind of formal um, evaluation of the technical and physical controls that the vendor has in place. Uh, Sometimes firms also engage a vendor uh, to do this as a managed service on behalf of the firm. So there are a lot of companies that not only offer software, but they offer a managed service where they actually perform the duties themselves rather than you having to hire staff to send out security assessments or do a, a risk assessment that your procurement team may do. The legal department, that could be your office of general counsel, or it could also be in-house attorneys working with you to review contracts, master service agreements, uh, NDAs, data processing agreements, data transfer agreements specific to GDPR. So the legal team is going to be critical in getting the proper framework in place. Uh, documenting the legal side of the business transactions with the vendors. In, in some firms, human resources gets involved. They may be conducting background checks on the vendors, especially if the vendor is a very small vendor. Uh, typically, larger vendors have more formalized processes in place and they do a pretty good job of vetting their workforce as part of the onboarding hiring. Um, but if you're engaging a court reporter or an expert witness, for example, the firm may want its HR department to run a background check on that independent contractor, similar to what they would do with a firm employee as part of onboarding. Your business analysts are going to be critical in helping you do reporting and analytics to measure uh, metrics uh, to demonstrate the success of the program as it moves forward. And I can't underestimate enough the importance of the executive management team and their role uh, in assembling a formal vendor uh, risk management program. The tone from the top is going to be key to your success. And um, it's going to be critical that you are able um, to have the right people uh, engaged in the program so that if you get pushback from attorneys, and you will, you know, this is going to be a huge cultural shift, you're going to have to rely on your chief operating officer, your managing partner, your general counsel to support you um, in helping to communicate the, the message about the necessity for the program. Next slide, please. Follow the money. That's, uh, <laughs> I can't emphasize this enough. Following the money uh, really involves getting the accounts payable and finance people engaged in the program from the get-go. Uh, they're the ones that are going to give you some key information relating to who your vendors actually are. You're going to have to look at the complete list. I suggest starting with uh, going back maybe 18 months to 24, looking at all the vendors that were actually paid. You want to look at how much they were paid. You also want to look independently at the volume. So you may have some vendors that you pay 
very small amounts of money time and time again. Those vendors, those repetitive vendors, they're going to be uh, high risk vendors uh, as well as uh, vendors that you pay large sums of money to. But you can't discount a random vendor, uh, you know, a one-time vendor. Uh, you also have to pay attention to them and you really need to understand the type of service or the product that the vendor is providing to the firm and do a full-blown risk analysis to determine if they're, you know, touching critical systems and, um, you know, do they have access to the physical office space, especially if they're unescorted. Um, so all those factors need to be measured and that's all part of what we're envisioning our procurement team is going to be very heavily involved in being the gatekeeper um, to determining if the vendor is somebody we want to do business with. Another essential function uh, is going to be to group your vendors into risk tiers. And there's a couple ways to do this. You can either try to do it manually uh, based on some kind of formalized documented criteria. If you do that, that criteria should be documented in your policy or your standard. If you download our white paper, you'll see an example of this in the white paper. Um, you can, uh, the other way to do it alternatively is to use a weighted questionnaire where you ask uh, the vendor a series of questions. Uh, there's some programming logic behind the questionnaire and depending how they score or how they respond, each response gets a score and the scores get tallied and the overall tally determines their risk. Um, that's a much more objective way uh, it's also a little bit more complicated to implement, but um, it's probably a, a, a better approach because it is more objective. Um, another thing that we're doing is uh, we're, we're looking at considering it, asking our vendors to acknowledge a code of conduct. Um, we've actually had our clients ask us to acknowledge their code of conduct. So it kind of goes full circle. We acknowledge theirs, they acknowledge ours, our suppliers have to acknowledge the code of conduct. And you might be asking yourself, what's in this code of conduct? Why is it so important? A lot of them really point back to the things Galena and I talked about in the beginning. Uh, it's the ESG. Uh, everybody wants to make sure we're all on the same page. Everybody wants to uh, make sure that, that their uh, vendors, and we are a vendor to our clients, they want to make sure that we're going to act ethically, not just on the case, but generally in the way we do business with everybody. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about, Patty, do you want to take uh, first no, step? you can go. No? Okay. So let's talk about the risk mitigation, actually. And Patty talked a lot about risk mitigation already. Um, but security assessment questionnaires are certainly one way to mitigate risk. Um, centralizing, like, like Patty suggesting, as much as possible, centralizing how you examine your vendors, what are the questions in general, is a great way to mitigate risk. Uh, when we talk about risk mitigation, there are really two uh, components to it, as we talk about in the paper, there is the component of, well, I've questioned things and I've done my best. And then, of course, I've provided legal protections in my contract that should it turn out that the vendor did not answer it exactly correctly and things happen, that there's assignment of uh, liability. And, and I think it's really important not to um, confuse the two. So it's not enough to just have a contract where you shift responsibility to the vendor. It's really, really important that you've done the right due diligence and ask the right questions, not just assume that if anything happens, the vendor is at fault because your reputation is at stake if something happens in the supply chain of that vendor. And like Patty said as well, in that questionnaire, it's important to find out what else is your vendor? Who else are they using? So um, that's really important. And um, you will have to accept some risks. There's always risks in doing business, but make sure there's a way to mitigate them. 
um, remediate as much as you can, and again, uh, have appropriate contracts so that um, appropriate responsibility is shifted to the vendor if they made representations to you. One of the big problems in this risk mitigation and in the law firm environment is the fact that there is ne not necessarily a centralized uh, procurement department. And a lot of times the lawyer, the legal team that's using, that's doing a case will engage a vendor in a, what I would call a rogue fashion, if you will. They want to work with this vendor and they bring them in. And uh, oftentimes uh, the rest of us have left holding the bag, if you will, and doing it after the fact. So getting ahead of the fact is always very important for risk mitigation as much as possible. Patty, anything else from your side? So we are running uh, short on time here. I think we actually went over. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just wrap it up by saying, I think it's really important to have an elevator pitch and to be able to sell your program to people whenever you encounter them and make your first impression your best impression. And with that, um, I'll turn it to Jim for Q&A. Sure, yeah, thank you, Patty and uh, Galena. Um, as you mentioned, um, due to the interest of time, maybe we'll, we'll forego the live Q&A, but we definitely encourage um, all of you to keep submitting those questions in the Q&A portion because our panelists can uh, live uh, answer the, the questions in a live format uh, through, um, through the Q&A portal. So we, we encourage you to keep submitting those questions through that portal. But uh, we'll move, thank you again so much, Galena and Patty for that segment. So we'll move on to our final segment, uh, strategies for collaboration site governance in law firms. And at this time, I'll hand it over to Karen Allen. curses of COVID, I was muted. Um, <laughs> I can go ahead to the next slide, Jim, thank you. Um, so so LFAGS, as um, Sue mentioned, has been uh, publishing papers for about 10 years now. And to date, most of these papers have been uh, a single treatise. And with this collaboration uh, paper, we um, decided as we started to, to draft it, that we wanted to take a different approach. And so, this, this paper, as opposed to being an end-to-end -end, um, document, is more a, a collection of broad stroke topics that we felt like were individual topics that could be consumed, at, you know, as the reader needed, either individually or taken as a whole. Um, as you get into the paper, um, what you'll find is that there's a lot of cross-referencing that we've done between the individual topics. Um, so what I'm going to do is basically just touch on some of the governance considerations um, on each of the subtopics in the paper as a whole. Jim, next slide. Um, so our first uh, topic deals with the choice of the collaboration tools. Um, there are several different tools that are available um, among them, things like Jabber, Microsoft Teams, Slack. And what firms need to consider is that each one of these tools has a different feature set, a different functionality, different nomenclature for what could potentially be the same functionality. And each one of them stores information differently. And so because it stores information differently and or may introduce new data repositories, um, firms need to put a governance umbrella around, they really need to understand when they're putting new tool into place, where all those pieces of data live, and then how they're going to be used. Um, as far as how to pick the choice of tool, um, not all solutions have the same set of features and depending on the needs of the firm, um, you may not need, you may only need the Hyundai, you may not need the Cadillac. And so it depends on what the firm's objectives are when they're trying to roll out the tool. Um, some of the primary factors to consider are what the business needs are, the usability needs, um, and, and, and basically balance those against the complexity of the implementation and the introduction of new risks and new content repositories in, um, in the firm. Uh, moving on to who governs the space. Um, so so the, 
from the interesting thing with collaboration spaces is that you may or may not control the space. So if it's an internally held collaboration space, whether it's something for internal only collaboration or something where you're inviting your, your clients to come in and collaborate with you in your space, um, regardless, requires a ton of cross-functional involvement. Typically that would involve teams um, your information governance team, your, your IT team, your security team, risk management, privacy, all of them need to be involved. Um, but IG as a, a, a needs to be involved at the forefront of the decision-making process to make sure that good controls are in place before anything is done. Um, if you look at the some of the, the features of that is, you know, putting into um, who can make retention and disposition decisions, how are new content repositories covered by existing policies and controls? Do you need new policies? What are the impacts on standard processes such as litigation holds and who's responsible for that in that space? Um, complicating things as well is with collaboration solutions is it could be that your client manages the space. And so if a client's ho hosting a space, the law firm really needs to work in their space. And then you have the issue of data preservation and how do you make sure work product that typically has been handled inside the doors of the law firm, which may now be occurring in a collaboration space hosted by the client. How do you make sure that that gets back to where it's supposed to be so that the law firm continues to hold a complete representation of the client file? Um, I'll give you an example of something along those lines was um, a couple of years ago, Microsoft um, reached out to most of their outside counsel and said, we don't want to collaborate in your space. We don't want to have to remember six different passwords and six different URLs. We're going to stand something up and you come to us. So if you have a client that, that makes that sort of demand, you need to know where that data is and what you need to potentially pull back into your own system. The other part of that is that you don't necessarily have control over the parameters that the client may have set regarding disposition and retention on things like chat and channel conversations. So something that you need to consider. Um, provisioning. The provisioning process is all about um, configuring the compliance components from the very beginning. Um, most firms will want to use um, predefined templates so that they can standardize the provisioning process. It gives another level of control about where the content may be stored in a collaboration space. Um, and it's really the key for end-to-end for -end life cycle management of the space. So templates can provide for things like client and matter um, categorization and labeling. It can provide for things like consistent naming, predictable content locations, making it easier to actually govern the data that's in there by setting it up properly from the get-go. Um, essentially, you'll have three general categories of sites that you would want to set up templates, and then your rules around how those sites would be pro provisioned. This would basically be client and matter level, administrative, and then potentially things that are project-based. Um, some of those things can take advantage of built-in governance and disposition functionality in, in the tools, um, but some of the built-in workflows may or may not be good for things like client and matter sites because they're based on an activity as opposed to based on a matter life cycle type of um, process. Um, similar to governing the space, managing access, um, among other things is who is going to manage the access, who is going to add new client, new users to the system, who can, how, how is the access controlled and managed? What is the process for getting external people access to the site? How are you going to handle multi-factor authentication for your external users? Um, but, you know, role-based access control should be used wherever possible so that you can configure a system for least privileged rights, especially when you're starting to bring your clients into the space. Um, also need to consider how ethical laws and outside council guidelines are implemented and maintained for the collaboration site content. Not all sites can be integrated into existing um, systems for managing things like ethical walls. So you have to consider how are you going to 
maintain those securities to all of this new site content that's being accessed here. Um, in addition to which for, for internal sites, for the most part, you're going to have automated access management. If you have someone leave the firm, they'll be deleted from your system. So they won't have access. But what about when a case team changes? There's a secretarial reassignment, things like that internally. So you have to think about how you're going to manage who can get access to what. And that feeds back into what Chuck, Chuck was talking about with the information governance requirements and minimizing who can have it even from internally. From an external um, aspect, you need to constantly be looking at your attestations for your external access and should the clients still be able to get to this site. Um, privacy laws, regulations, client requirements, all of these are considered. Um, most, most collaboration sites are cloud-based. If a client requirement says you can't have stuff in the cloud, you may have to get special privilege from them or permission from them to be able to host a thing in the cloud. In addition, depending on <coughs> pardon me, what safeguards are needed as far as privacy regulations, where the data is stored, um, and those types of things. Um, the firms have to, you'd have to take that into consideration. Um, you know, it, this is all aspects of it. It's a, it, does it apply to a chat? Does it apply to a document? Does it apply to something that's stored in an online site repository? For instance, Teams builds a SharePoint document library. You need to make sure that all of your client requirements and all of your protections based on different regulations are implemented there. And you need, you need a defined process for capturing that. Um, Yes, I know I'm trying, to, <laughs> I'm trying to hurry. Um, we move on to syncing content with the collaboration tool in your document management system. Um, firms typically have a policy, um, have a policy designated in document management systems to sort the truth for the client file. So firms will need to decide if the collaboration platform content is it a separate approved repository? Do you need to get the content out of that repository back into the DMS? Are you going to sync that as a one-time thing when matter closes? Are you going to implement a tool that may do that in a real-time sync so that you've constantly got a replicated copy between your collaboration platform and your document management system? <laughs> the most important thing to, to consider here is depending on where people are working and depending on the way that you implement the system, you need to make sure that all of your users are always working with the most recent version of the copy or the right version of the copy. Um, some of the other considerations are, you know, depending on the format that documentation can get in and out of a collaboration tool, is it potentially another secondary system of record instead of trying to shoehorn content into the document management system? Um, data portability. Um, most of your existing portability and matter mobility policies should probably cover a great deal of this data. Um, however, from a, from a policy standpoint, but from a procedural standpoint, they need, may need to be extended to cover new content repositories, um, things like OneDrive, hidden mailboxes in Microsoft Teams. Um, need to consider what from the collaboration site is considered portable and how can that content be reviewed and culled and once it's exported is it in a usable format that's even available um, you know so um, you need to be ensure ensure that the content can be located transferred and it's usable once it's exported out of the system um, disposition um, Disposition in general should always be a repository neutral. Um, so any content that's in a collaboration space should follow the firm's established disposition policies and programs. Um, existing policies may need to be modified to account for new repositories, again, such as OneNote and Planner. Um, and then the firm will need to make decisions about whether the content should continue to live in a collaboration space, whether it should be moved to a different repository of records, such as the DMS. If it is moved to the DMS, what are the rules around what needs to be moved? Um, is it just documents? Is it channel conversations that are the equivalent of an email conversation? If the firm decides that the collaboration space is a secondary repository, how is it maintained? How is it archived? How do you manage when 
when a native archival is event-based, not matter-based, and if it lives in the art, it, you know, how is all the content retained in your collaboration space? Um, so I know I went through that relatively quickly. Um, you know, yes, our takeaways uh, in general, um, the, you know, the tenets of good governance are applicable across all platforms in any software ecosystem. Collaboration tools are no different. Um, these tools are very intuitive. They don't require a high level of training on the end user, meaning rapid broad adoption. However, there are an extensive amount of moving parts on the back end that most professionals in the IG world and even in the IT world are not used to dealing with. And so it's really important to make sure that you get all of those controls in from, from day one. Um, you know, the, the, there is a, uh, there's a vast array of data that gets added. There's different repositories and it's very important to know where all of that stuff is. Um, you know, a, another way of, uh, of, of looking at it that, you know, that, that I like to look at it from a holistic perspective is that you really need to know that you've like, basically you've secured everything before you can let anybody go out and start working in this kind of a world. So um, I think that's... Yeah, that's it, wow. <laughs> that, that was very fast. It is a very long paper and I highly recommend that you read the whole thing. I tried to hit the highlights, so. Oh, we think you did a phenomenal job, Karen, as did all our panelists. I know we, we ran up against the time, but... Uh, Arma did say that they'll pass along any questions that are in the Q&A. So, um, you know, one of our panelists will definitely uh, be reaching out to you to answer those questions directly. Uh, so you get that personal, that personal service. Uh, of course, too, on the slide here, this is our link uh, to our papers. Um, so if you'd like to, you know, the, I'm sure the, the PowerPoint will be shared and uh, these are the link to our papers for you to download. Um, I'm sure your appetite has been wet to go download these papers. Um, here's the presenter's info as well. Uh, email addresses, uh, LinkedIn, right? We encourage you to connect with us on LinkedIn so we can further the conversation as well. And, uh, you know, again, a special thank you to, you know, the Law Firm Information Governance uh, Symposium at large to Iron Mountain for sponsoring this webinar, not only this webinar, but the symposium all the way through. We, we certainly could not have done this uh, without the support of Iron Mountain. And again, thank you. Thank you, uh, you all for listening in today and Arma for hosting. So enjoy the rest of your day.